Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You hear the classroom too? Yeah, it was better the next day or two. Oh, good. Yeah, I guess it's part of the Yeah, it was. I did sign up for the This week, it's January. work and everything. That's the short part I got. Yeah, for my ex husband was just here for a funny I haven't seen you in years. So it's just, yeah, Morning. 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 Can you all in Zoom hear us? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. I can. Yes. Thank you. Can you see the PowerPoint okay? No, we can't see the PowerPoint yet. You can't see the PowerPoint. Candace, oh, you can't. Okay, now we see it, Sarah. Perfect. Okay. I don't know if I'm even going to Where's my key? <laughs> <laughs> see it. Yeah. Just take some beautiful pictures. Thank you. Oh Can God. you still see the PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So I'm right in here. You're in there. Yep. This is my okay. And then let's make sure. Yep. Okay. Sarah's wonderful. She <laughs> came in early and uh walked me through getting everything set up. I brought my laptop, but I don't need it because they have a much better setup here in this classroom. How many of you have been before Osher Ollie classes? A lot of you. I'm Marilyn Ribble, and I come to you from 30 years teaching at California State University in San Marcos, taught communication. I taught Osher lifelong learning classes. I've taught about eight different classes. So this is my first taste of teaching here in Texas or presenting, not really teaching just kind of talking with you about Winston Churchill this morning. So I, I came to Texas, never thought I'd live in Texas. I'm a St. Louis native, so grew up in the Midwest. My dad was transferred with General Electric when I was a freshman in high school to California. So I never felt like a Californian. I was always a Midwest Southern more girl in my heart. But about two years ago, my younger son called and said, we're all moving to Texas, mom, sell your house. <laughs> and I thought, oh man. <laughs> but about that time, the campus closed because of COVID. I had gone to classes on a Wednesday and Thursday night, they said, don't come back. So I haven't been back. So it was a perfect opportunity to, to move, buy a house here, teach my last two years on Zoom, and then retire. So I've been very lucky to have Three grown children, um, two wonderful daughters-in-law. I don't think they tell nasty mother-in-law jokes about me. I think I'm good because I don't interfere too much. And I bake a really nice cake that they like. And they always say, mom, can I have that recipe? I go, it's in the will. <laughs> That's when you get the recipe. So they invite me to things if I bring the cake. And I have uh, eight grandchildren from 21 down to age eight and three great-grandchildren by marriage. So when we have family gatherings, it's a lot of s'mores and hot dogs and hamburgers. But I'm very blessed to be here, and I'm very happy to come and be part of Ollie here at Texas Tech. So Winston Churchill's the topic. What do you know about Winston Churchill? Anybody been to the War Museum in London? Yes? Lighting bourbon. I'm sorry? He liked his bourbon. Oh, yes, he did. Scars. <laughs> and so, can you imagine living underground with him through World War II and him smoking those cigars? <laughs> and the very enclosed, you've been there, so you know how almost claustrophobic it can be. The water was uh, sort of a potable system where they had to change it manually 
there were no elevators. And so it was more like a bomb shelter that they lived in. But I'll pass this around uh, toward the end of the class if you want to take a look. I was lucky enough to be there this summer. In fact, I was in England the day the Queen died. Mm -hmm. And so I had gone on this trip with a friend of my younger brother's, who I didn't know very well, but they knew each other about 40 years. And this friend's wife had passed away about 10 years ago. And his daughter was getting married in Lake Como, Italy, and he needed a date. <laughs> and my brother said, invite my sister. <laughs> Look, oh. So we, we had met three times before we left for a month in Europe. <laughs> but he, I know, he turned out to be a wonderful traveling. I tried to explain this to my kids. You know, we have separate rooms. <laughs> we're called traveling companions. You know, we're not shacking up. This is all, you know, my generation stuff. And I, I think they finally understood that it was more of a, a traveling convenience, someone to go and do things with. Mm -hmm. But we had a wonderful time and saw, we spent a day at Brighton Beach, but then we were in London the day Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We were at the Savoy Theater. So my brother says to Gary, he said, you were really smart. Have my sister in London the day the queen died. <laughs> She'll remember that forever. So it was a lot of fun. So most of you have had a chance to find out where you're from and your, your backgrounds. Uh, so what's your interest in Winston Churchill? Just, he's such an- He's uh, amazing. He's amazing, <laughs> amazing. Didn't they try to tear his statue down at one time a couple of years ago? And they put guards around it to make sure that nobody got close enough. So we're going to talk about him. I brought some books to share with you. This one's from the Marble Falls Library. And so if you're interested, you can take a look at it after class, see if it's something that you would want to read further and uh, take a look at the table of contents and the photographs. I have photographs in the presentation. This is my own book on Franklin and Winston. You know, they had a lot of clandestine meetings during World War II, and there's a telephone room in the war rooms specifically where Winston could go and talk to Franklin without anyone, of course, hearing him. At one point during World War II, Winston took to wearing those one-piece jumpsuits, kind of a onesie thing under which he wore nothing. But he always had one of his aides help dress him. And so Roosevelt comments on wheeling himself into Winston's room to talk in the morning, Winston stark naked and his aide having him step into this onesie and zip it up. And Winston paying no attention to here's this man dressing him. And it, uh, part of his character and that uh, egotistical attitude that he had and the fact that he could get away with most, most anything. And I think that was true of him his whole life. He tended to do what he wanted to do, the way he wanted to do it. It is said of him when he gave speeches in Parliament, he gave his speech and then he walked out. He didn't care what the rebuttal was. He didn't care to hear what anyone else said after his speech. <clears throat> he had said what he wanted to and moved on. So Winston Leonard Spencer, Spencer Churchill so you're welcome to borrow any of the books I brought this morning. Um, the two library books, this is the other one I brought. Winston Churchill, 40 Ways to Look at Him. Sounds like 40 Ways to Leave Your Lover, right? Remember that song? So this is a brief account of his life, but it does have some interesting little snapshots of him in different situations. It also has an interesting list of his contemporaries, which I'll talk about some of the people that he knew during his lifetime. So I'm happy that you're here. Um, we'll have a chance to, of course, ask questions if you want, or if you have information that you wanna share with everyone, please feel free to do that and contribute, kind of an open discussion. And I think it makes it more fun, especially small group. Is it too bright? Just the lighting, it doesn't overshadow the PowerPoint. <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about his life and times. And then I have some contacts or links to media things that you might be interested in. And I'm going to give a printout of those to Sarah 
after class and she will email them to you. So if you want the media links, like some of the movies, and you may have watched some already on uh, the History Channel or other documentaries, but there are certainly a lot of links to his YouTube speeches. So there's Winston, born in 1874 and died at age 90 in 1965. We were all alive then. Do you remember headlines? Do you? What do you remember? Well, I remember being glued to all these reports, and uh, you know, I just have always thought him a fascinating person. And so, um, I, it was it was fun to see the 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 older the the news reels and things like that that they they put together during the funeral times. So. Mm -hmm. He had quite a funeral. Yes. And when he did, you watch the Queen? Any of you watch mm -hmm. that on TV? Yeah, it was good. And they. Yeah, that was that's wonderful, I think. And they they showed his no, they showed um, his funeral, was it? And he walked in, made sure he was last and walked in. Um, must have been the queen mother when she passed away. So this Rosetta Stone has a set of biographies about Winston Churchill, and there are eight books. I don't know if you have seen any of them, but it's possible to get the whole, whole set. It started, his son Randolph Churchill started writing this biography of his father, and it was finished by Sir Martin Gilbert. And so these eight volumes include some of Winston's letters, some of his papers, and hundreds of private things. It comes on Kindle as well, if you have a Kindle talks about his adventures in South Africa and India. There was a time in India, he was on a train kind of out in the middle of nowhere and some Indian uh, started, Indian, the, the militants started storming the train and Winston jumped out a window and took off running across the desert and escaped the fight that went on later that day. So you can see he was always kind of an out of the box thinker. So I have um, these pictures, eight volumes, his youth as a young statesman, the challenge of war, and of course he was prime minister twice, the world in torment following World War II, the prophet of truth, the finest hour is also a video uh, on his life. And so there are eight. I would say other than just influential in British history, influential in world history, I would rank him up there with almost any of our politicians, statesmen. And I don't know about you, but I don't think we see statesmen really anymore. We see politicians. But when you look back at some of the speeches that have been given over the years by our political leaders, Lincoln, even Kennedy's, uh, inaugural address, John F. Kennedy's, and those were statesmanlike, as was Winston Churchill. We don't we don't hear that kind of thing. I taught college for thirty years, and I have to unhappily say that the incoming freshmen from high school are very uh, lax. The vocabulary is maybe fourth grade their ability to write or outline or to spell or to have original thought or critically think. They come to you at the beginning of class and it's, what do you want? What do you want from me out of this class? I just wanna give you what you want. So if you say, well, I want seven speeches and five outlines and I want you to do all the quizzes, they don't wanna think any further than, than that. And so it's um, disconcerting to see our young people I did substitute over at Marble Falls High School back in January for about five or six times. And then I said, please don't call me anymore. I can't, I can't handle these students. They're rude, they're mouthy. They lay on the floor rather than sit in the seat and they tell you, so what? There's nothing you can do. And so I videotaped one class that was leaning over the tables laying on the floor, not doing anything that they were supposed to be doing. And they started videotaping me back. 
And I thought, well, that's it for me. And I excused the class and I never went back because I thought I don't, I'm too old and I don't have the patience to work with this. So Winston Churchill is someone I'm sorry to see we don't pay a lot of attention to. We don't really study his speeches. So he's uh, challenging. He's the father of Randolph Lord Churchill and, uh, or his father was Randolph Lord Churchill who married Jenny Jerome. And she had, it was one of the marriages where he had the title, she had the money. And there have been documentaries as well on TV about the titled Englishman coming over, well, Downton Abbey, as if you've watched any of Downton Abbey. And these men would go over and meet these very wealthy heiresses and marry them so that they could put a roof over their homes that were starting to fall down. So we'll talk a little bit about that. He had a very Victorian childhood, so a very strict upbringing. As you know, Victoria and Albert weren't really a lot of fun. They had nine children. And um, I do a class on Victoria the last, her later years, not the early years, but her later years as a widow. And uh, he went to Harrow and had a formal education. He married Clementine, Clemmy, as he called her, and they had four children. So a little bit about history. John Churchill was the first Duke of Marlborough. And as you, as you know, there is still a Duke of Marlborough, but this I don't think any of us, I know I couldn't trace my history back that far to uh, a duke that many centuries ago. This is the ancestral home of the Churchill Marble family called Blenheim. Did you get to see that? Anyone who went to England, did you get to, did you get to go in? Did you? When I was there, it was closed. I was there in March around St. Patrick's. It wasn't open yet, but we got to drive by and see the land around it. I imagine it was amazing. It's probably been 20 years since I was there. Mm -hmm. I, I, did, I did remember it. Yeah, I doubt they've changed it mm -hmm. much. They don't, they don't change too much of that. And then he lived in Chartwell later on in his life. And this is where he did his painting. Uh, this is where their daughter Marigold, I think she was four and she died. And uh, some of the quotes, you know, he's very famous for his witty quotes, uh, short comments. So some of them we'll talk, bring up in class. Then just an overview of some media. There's uh, Sir Martin Gilbert, of course, who wrote, finished Randolph's book, uh, <clears throat> talks a little bit in, on the History Channel about the prime minister's life. The Gathering Storm, starring Albert Finney and Vanessa Redgrave. You may have seen that. That's fairly recent. Um, anybody remember Albert Finney? He played, he played Daddy Warbucks in Annie, the movie. No. And there was an old movie with uh, Audrey Hepburn called Two for the Road. That's when I first got a crush on Albert Finney. That was a long time ago. So the episode was Churchill in the Cabinet War Room, which is this, it takes you behind the scenes. So you can take a look at that. And then Germany, arming for war. And of course, Churchill was extremely defiant with uh, Neville, who said, no, we're going to pacify the Germans. We don't want to go to war. And there was so much in that era. Um, English history, of course, Edward was leaving the throne to marry the twice divorced Wallace Simpson, becoming the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And the Germans were courting them at that time, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, believing that once they overthrew the English government, they were going to put uh, David and Wallace on the throne as the new King and Queen of England because they were sympathetic to the Germans. Uh, that was referred to a little bit also in The Queen in one of the episodes when Uncle David came to her and wanted to be forgiven by the Queen and wanted to come back to England, and she had found all this out. The Black Dog, I have an excerpt to read to you from one of the books. He suffered from what he called the Black Dog. He himself spoke freely about his Black Dog, as he called depression. In 1944, he reminisced to his doctor 
When I was young, a black depression settled on me. I don't like to stand by the side of a ship and look down into the water. A second's action would end everything. The black dog appeared several times during Churchill's life. And in 1911, he wrote Clementine about a doctor who had cured an acquaintance of depression. I think this man might be useful to me if my black dog returns. He seems quite away from me now. It's such a relief. All the colors come back into the picture. In 1915, he fell into the depression, the Dardanelles disaster, and his fall from office. Clementine, you called it as the worst part of our life together, was the failure of the Dardanelles expedition. Winston was filled with such a black depression that I felt he would never recover and even feared at one time he might commit suicide. And he, in the Franklin and Winston, just a brief reference, because at that time, people didn't talk about mental illness or depression. <clears throat> He experienced a sense of annoyance and depression. And he wrote this in a book that he wrote called Savrola, the story of a young soldier politician in an imaginary state of Lauritania, which of course was based on his life, of which of course he was the hero. Life seemed unsatisfactory, something was lacking. And so what clarified the mind and lifted the gloom Churchill wrote was the thought of death. When the notes of life ring false, men should correct them by referring to the tuning fork of death. It is clear that menacing tone is heard, that the love of life grows keenest in the human heart. So he was aware of this and lived with it all his life. And it's interesting that uh, he, he brought it out and referred to it as one of the driving forces in his life, besides his education, besides his marriage, besides his abilities as a politician. So it did play a major role in becoming who he was. So his recurrent episodes of depression, some believe allowed him to realistically assess the threat of Germany. He understood that conciliating with Hitler was not going to keep Germany from advancing across Europe. And he was one of the few people at the time that held that belief and fought for it. Of course, he wanted the United States in World War II because he knew that he needed the armaments and the support of the military. So he was courting uh, Franklin Roosevelt at the time because he needed the help of the military for England to be able to win the war. Lord Beaverbrook, who was a publisher in England, described Churchill as either at the top of the wheel of confidence or at the bottom of an intense depression. Today, we might call that what, manic? depressive episodes, I'm sorry, bipolar. bipolar. So he may well have been, I don't think that's a word that's ever been uh, described. Of course, his most famous quote, never, never give up, sometimes with even more nevers, never, 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 never give up, uh, never give in. This is the lesson, never give in, never, 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 in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense, never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. So he was not one who saw war as something that you walk away from or that you quit or that you don't follow through to the very end. And I think that's another value or action of a value that we don't see much of. And uh, I'm not sure we see as much of in our young people. Uh, it seems interesting to me that so many veterans are running for offices right now in this midterm election. Many of them, one of the first things they say about themselves is that they're a veteran of Afghanistan or Iraq or that they're a Marine or a Navy. And they seem to be putting emphasis back on building up the number of veterans in our government. 
He went to Harrow in 1941. He gave a three word speech, never give in and sat down. Try to think what grade I would give that. And I've heard some very interesting speeches in my time. Some of them are, are rather circular. You know, I, I bought a dog, I'm raising a dog. Now I'm still raising my dog. And now my dog doesn't do anything I want it to. There's, there's no, I don't know. Uh, so he would continue going to Harrow, making annual appearances because he was welcomed there. And he was greeted as the success in politics that until 1961, and then he died of course in 65. Some of his ancestors, a picture from 1854 of his mother, Jenny Jerome, an American woman, and with the, her two sons, Jack and Winston. And then I wanna show you, Okay, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to get back. I should have asked Sarah how I get back. My flash drive. Yes, please. I thought it was right here. She I'm sure she did, my speaker's on. What did I do that I lost my flash drive? Oh, I don't know. It was here behind all this behind stuff. Me. Yeah. It's a light mixing case. Where are you? There it is. And then are you showing something? Because we'll have to screen share it. So if you want to pull it up, then I'll screen share it with everybody. Okay. This one. And so you want me to go to screen share? You have to do that. Play. Yeah. Is this one right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. No problem. No, no. I just go back to this one. Perfect. <laughs> go back. Oh, good. We can minimize that. There you go. And it's on slideshow. It is. I have to click it so that it will. From the beginning. Okay. It's already. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. No problem. So a little bit of the ancestors who shaped his character when you look back uh, who some of the people were that um, became his family, the National Portrait Gallery in London, the first Duke of Marlborough. And they're all sort of creepy, aren't they? Without any eyes or anything. If you've gone through any of the museums, the Vatican or uh, the Louvre, you see so Winston and Elizabeth, this is back in, in the 17th century. He says that the conditions at Ash might have contributed to prevailing impressions in Winston Churchill's mind, a hatred of poverty. And secondly, the need of hiding thoughts and feelings from those to whom their expression would be repugnant. And that's the old British stiff upper lip, isn't it? Sort of came to Winston through studying his ancestors. So they were uh, started and studied by Devon, a Devon historian, Hoskins, and originated at the estate of Churchill. So he traces these ancestors back hundreds of years. They were looking for a family name. You know, the English family changed their name from Mountbatten to Windsor, World War II, because Mountbatten was considered too German. So they took on the more Anglicized family of Windsor. So this was their motto, faithful, but unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Not exactly an optimistic model, motto to put on your family crest. And then at some point, 
if you're interested in family crest, have any of you looked up your own family crest? Yeah, I looked up uh, Ribble, which of course was my married name, um, but there is a Ribble, England, and there's a river, a Ribble River that runs through this little town. So I'm thinking of going back running for mayor, right? <laughs> Ribble of, of Ribble, I thought maybe I, I would get elected. So during the Middle Ages, people were unable to read or write. Signs were needed for all visual. Don't you feel like we're back there now? And, and the counting when you cross the street? Do you, do you, doesn't it start at like 15 or something and you've got to start crossing the street when the, when the bell goes and then get across the street before the last? It's, uh, I don't know, it's sort of frightening, but everything has become signs again. When we went to Pompeii and walking down the streets of, of course, this, they've, they've only uncovered about 75% of Pompeii. They're still trying to archaeologic, archaeologically uncover the last 25%. But there was a street where the houses of ill repute were, and above them were symbols kind of called the menu of what clients could expect for their money. Um, so it was, it was, it was an interesting uh, use of signage, I thought, back in Pompeii. So there was a coat of arms when there were no numbered houses. So an address was a descriptive phrase. Coats of arms came into being for the reason that men went into battle heavily armed and were difficult to recognize. So we still see that in our military. We see that in our athletic teams. We see that they're all dressed alike to, to be able to identify them. This all comes from that time. They had helmets. So, you know, he always wore a hat, a hum, Hamburg, is that what he wore? Top hat, Churchill. Then almost 300 years later, Winston writes, his his first uh, his first book, and it's called Marlboro on his ancestor. He wanted to make him relevant to Winston's day and age. He looked for those things that would cross the divide of time, and so he spent ten years writing this on his ancestor. What does he call it? One million words long in 10 years in the making. But it's considered a historical masterpiece. I haven't read it. Anybody? I got through Gone with the Wind a few times. That was, that was pretty long. Now they give it to us in series. They're right, The Hunger Games. Anybody read all The Hunger Games or Harry Potters? Have you read all the Harry Potters? No, I haven't either. I got to about the second one and then it was all the in and out of the mirrors and the big dog and I thought maybe not. So I think the younger kids really like it though. So a little more about his ancestors. Uh, this is where Blenheim came into play in 1704. And John Churchill never fought a battle he didn't win. And Winston took that to heart too. You don't go into battle to lose, you go into battle to win. So down through the ages, he can trace his family as being implicit and very uh, involved with keeping English history and some of the values, traditions that came out of these different dynasties, which then, of course, are him. His descendant, Marlborough, bequeathed the world. Another military strategist and diplomat, of course, Winston Churchill. And if you get a chance to go through here and see the way this is set up and the way some of the rooms, it's completely set up by function. And you can tell 
that Churchill had a very definite hand in this happening. There's even a bedroom for Clementine. It's got chintz bedspread, and I think there's a pair of slippers still sitting by the bed, needlepoint rocker in the room. And when he was there for too long a period of time, she would actually go and live there as well to keep him company. He hated to be away from her. Uh, despite its age, Macaulay's History of England uh, is probably still one of the most definitive works of English history. John Churchill was a soldier and statesman. His career spanned five monarchs, the range of five monarchs. He was a lowly page at the House of Stuart. Stuart, of course, was Mary, uh, served James, Duke of York, early 1680s, and earned advancement, much like Winston, through courage and diplomatic skill. And here he is, his ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough. William and Mary, you may have heard of the College of William and Mary in the colonies on the East Coast. Is it in Virginia or South Carolina? Williamsburg, Virginia. Williamsburg, Virginia. My sister went there. Oh, she went there? So it's in this way of having military battles, being a good strategist, being a good spokesman, that you attained title, you attained rank, you attained property, you attained notoriety. And these things, because of the Churchill name, were handed down to certainly his father, Randolph Churchill. And we'll get down to him. If you want to read more about uh, these early ancestors, we could do uh, a further partial class on them. Then we get into the mistresses of the Churchills. I don't think Winston ever had a mistress. He was flirtatious though. He was he was quite flirtatious, but not, not mistresses. So these are some of the women that were part of his history. Princess Anne, of course, came to the throne. Still in the 16 and 17 hundreds. And the Churchill name. Anne married Charles Spencer, third Earl of Sunderland, 1699. Their son, Charles, became third Duke of Marlborough, and their son, John, is the ancestor of Earl Spencer, and therefore he's related to Princess Diana, or she's related to him. So when she married Charles, remember they were able to trace her back to Queen Victoria and Charles back to Queen. I can't believe he's Charles III. I don't know. Have you? I've watched him since he was a kid growing up. I think we're only about a year apart in age. And... Um, of course, when the queen died, he was only three or four miles away, Buckingham Palace, and we were in London, the closest I'll ever be to a king of England, but um, then the fall from power, the Battle of Plenheim, and then here's the famous painting by Van Brugge of Blenheim, it's huge. Can imagine trying to heat someplace like that. And all, it only had what fireplaces? It was nothing else. I like the history part, but we'll we'll get into something a little more current. I lost it. <laughs> if you show me how to how to find that. 
code. And every time you click out for some reason, it wants to do full screen. There you go. Where is it? Whenever you get down here? No, whenever you click out, for some reason, it makes um, Zoom full screen for you. So you just have to exit the full screen. Okay. So I want to go back in here. And I want Mm -hmm. Thank you much. Mm -hmm. Can't see four, just the notes, but not. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. And then make sure you share it. I want to go over here. Slideshow. Can you? Okay. I'm doing my glass so I can share it. We're sharing the evidence real soon. I know I can't see the. Where am I? Okay, there, there, there. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Yeah. In Hey, Sir Winston was born in Oxfordshire, England. He enters the House of Commons in 1901. What else happened in 1901? Sorry? I don't know. I said I give up. <laughs> Come on, take a guess. 1901. After the longest uh, wearing black of anybody in their life, um, Victoria died. So Albert had died, what, 30 or 40 years before, but she died in 1901 and she died out on the Isle of, of Wight. So he marries Clementine in 1908, serves as first Lord of the Admiralty and then Prime Minister of Great Britain for the first time, 40 to 45 and again, 51 through 55. He was knighted. He wins the Nobel Prize for Literature, retires from the House of Commons, and then dies in 1965. I don't know too many people that would have had such a full life. Why is this doing this? Okay, this one isn't changing. He began as a conservative MP or member of parliament in 1900, but he became disaffected and he joined the Liberals. He became disaffected with the Conservative Party and joined the Liberals in 1906. And then in World War I, he was first Lord of the Admiralty, but afterwards he switched sides again to rejoin the Conservatives in 1924. This can work better.
I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm using the wrong mouse. Get that change over here. You can also use the arrow keys that are on the keyboard too. That might be easier. The arrows on the keyboard would be easier. Okay. It might be, yeah. Okay. You're right. I think I'm going backwards though. <laughs> Thank you. So certainly a great cigar smoker. You know who else is this great cigar smoker? Do you ever listen to Dennis Prager on uh, radio or uh, anything? He's on 93 The Answer. He has a, a, a show, I think around 11 or noon, most days of the week. Um, he's a cigar smoker. So he talks about at night coming home and lighting his cigar by the fire and his dog coming over and laying by his feet. Sounds very uh, English statesman. So the Churchill factor, how one man made history. He stands alone. Winston Churchill remains a one man argument for the idea that history is a tale of singular individuals and shining deeds. So again, this singular individuals is something that we don't see much of in this day and age. Uh, we seem to run more to clusters of politicians rather than individuals who stand what we might have called head and shoulders above the rest. Poor people, poor people, they trust me and I can give them nothing but disaster for quite a long time. So this was in 1940 at the beginning, of course, of World War II. Poland, Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. So England was certainly in the war at this time. He suffered a domestic humiliation of losing the general election and with it being a prime minister. He was returned to power in 51, where he remained until 55 when ill health and visibly failing powers caused him to resign. Must have been very difficult for him to resign from the position of prime minister. That to him was just the best, the best thing of all. There is a video link in here, which I will put in the notes that Sarah will email to you. And it's called, I have nothing to offer but blood. And it's one of his finer speeches toward the end of his career as prime minister. Well, we were doing very well there with. Some of the metaphors we shall fight given in the House of Commons on June 4th, 1940 at the end of the evacuation of British and French troops from Dunkirk. Again, there's a really good movie about Dunkirk. I think Mrs. Miniver was about Dunkirk back, when was that one? That was a long time ago, but that would be another good movie to watch, just uh, fictionalized, but certainly giving the era. We shall fight. Uh, a YouTube video that you can watch that I'll put on the bibliography for you. And then there are some analysis of his speeches, The Roar of the Lion, The Untold Story of Churchill's World War II Speeches. Uh, from a critical and analytical view. So if you're interested in reading additional information, not just the speech, but how it was kind of crafted, how it was taken apart. A partial, yes. His speeches, did he actually write all of his speeches? He did. Because today that doesn't happen. No, no, you have speech writers, buzzwords, uh, things that, that are, inherent because of the social media, I think, that we deal with. But he did write all, and he 
labored over them and he scratched them out and he lay in his bathtub with his cigar and the water sloshing over and possibly a drink or more. Uh, he, would, he would write his own speeches or he would sometimes dictate. There was a dictaphone uh, in the war rooms and he would dictate speeches, things he wanted to say to the British people and then those were typed up for him. He had personal secretaries that would type for him, open his mail, read his mail to him while he was soaking in the tub or lying in bed. He was not uh, a person who ran around and did all of his own uh, work, but he did write and, and wrote his own speeches, yes. Was it, he was a stutterer. Yes, yes. And he practiced in his bathtub also. As he did I practice in yes. his bathtub. And he listened to records, much like if you watch the King's Speech. Yeah. Uh, that that and, was... And, and there was a movie recently, Dunkirk. And that also illustrates mm -hmm. uh, what he was doing just maybe in the last eight years, five years. That would be a good one to watch. Is it a documentary or is no, it a, it's a, movie. a movie? It's a movie. Okay. And then, of course, there's the movie World War II. And uh, do you watch any of the documentaries put together by, I'm not going to be able to think of his name. Burns. Yes, Ken Burns. He did World War II, the Civil War, the Dust Bowl, uh, the Depression, and he did the one on uh, alcohol. Amazing. He's he he does his research. He would be fun to work for. I think that would be a good job researching for Ken Burns. He earns some, of course, honors and awards as a statesman and author. John F. Kennedy. Uh, proclaimed Churchill the first honorary citizen of the United States, even though he had British citizenship. There was a proposed dukedom for him, but people felt he had enough. They, they really didn't want to bestow more uh, upper class honors on Churchill. They felt that being Sir, you know, Winston Churchill was enough. He was a Colonel in Chief of the Fourth Queen's Own Hussars, a Knight of the Garter, um, which is probably one of the highest awards he could get, and then the Nobel Prize for Literature. The Commonwealth of Kentucky made him a Kentucky Colonel, so I guess if he taken up fried chicken or something. <laughs> I don't know what Winston would have taken cigars. Maybe he would have had a house of cigars. Um, buildings, highways, statues, of course, lots and lots of things are named after him. Uh, the highest of these was the state funeral, which prior had never been given to someone not of royal rank. So it was held at St. Paul's Cathedral had lain in state, uh, only granted to, uh, or had been granted to no one besides a previous monarch or consort. So he was afforded the highest honors at his death that England could give. He suffered a stroke that left him ill. He died at his London home nine days later on January 4th. I vow to thee uh, his farewell by the nation. And again, this is a link that I would be happy to include in it, rather than taking your time now, include in a bibliography for you. Lady Churchill and the couple's eldest surviving daughter, Mary, uh, were with him throughout his illness. Their son, Randolph, uh, were, was seen uh, arriving for at this period at the time of his death with his son, Winston. And he had an actress daughter, Lady Sarah Audley. Anyone ever see her in anything? I think you can find on Netflix if you go back and do a search for her. Uh, you can find her in some really old, not very good, but you can see her acting. Here's his statue. 
in Parliament Square. It was unveiled by his widow, Lady Churchill. <coughs> he had a nickname for her. It was in the Queen. What did he call her? Um, I know he called her Clemmy, but there was like Bunny Rabbit. Don't be mad at your at your at your little puppy dog. I don't know. It was very endearing and very almost nursery sounding. These names that he had for for his wife. For the history buff who has everything, a vial of Winston Churchill's blood is going up on the auction block. He famously said he had nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And now some of the blood is to be auctioned off by Duke's auctioneers on March. I wonder what they got for that. And then the blood was collected when Churchill was, oh, $1,550 with a signed declaration by the nurse detailing the circumstances under which she acquired it. Collected when Churchill was in the hospital for a fractured hip in 1962. She received special permission to keep the vial, but not for very long, right? Then she auctioned it off for the money. Upon the nurse's death, it was bequeathed to a friend who decided to sell it. Oh, it wasn't the nurse, it was the friend who sold it. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll think better of the nurse then. This was supposedly attributed to Winston, but has been proved to not be attributed. If you're not a liberal when you're 25, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative by the time you're 35, you have no brain. There is no record of anyone hearing Winston say this, but looking back, right? He started as a liberal. Six years later, he changed parties, changed again, and then went back to being a conservative. So apparently based possibly on his own, his own background. Surely Churchill can't have used the words attributed to him. He's been a conservative at 15 and a liberal at 35. He would have talked so disrespectfully to Clemmy, who is generally thought to have been a lifelong liberal. So Clemmy was a liberal. Winston kind of seesawed back and forth a little bit over his political career, maybe looking more like where he could get reelected. You know, which way is the country going so that I can keep my office. <clears throat> Kennedy described him as mobilizing the English language and sending it into battle. And Edward R. Murrow, right? You remember him, a famous broadcast personality said, I can hear it now and possibly uh, elsewhere coined that phrase, I can hear it now. The full quote occurs in Murrow's introduction to his Churchill war speech. Now the hour had come for him to mobilize the English language and send it into battle, a spearhead of hope for Britain and the world. We have joined together some of that Churchillian prose. It sustained, it lifted the hearts of an island of people when they stood alone. It's true, there wasn't much that England had to hold on to during those early years of the war of the war and the blitz. He was nineteen forty, he went to the king and the king asked him to mobilize a government. And Churchill, of course, I'm sure without a second thought, said, uh, I would certainly do so. And he did and knew exactly what to do. He uh, knew what the plan needed to be. Then there was the third husband of Jenny, Spencer Churchill, his mother. Um, life in Britain with Jenny was expensive and irritating. And in the spring of 1921, her third husband returned to Africa on a commercial venture. So Jenny didn't ever stop uh, having a very affluent and scandalous life, actually. His mother, supposedly when he married Clemmy before the wedding night, he went to his mother to ask for advice. He said, I want this to go well. 
So what advice can you give me so that my wedding night with Clemmy has a happy outcome? And whatever she said to him, he went back to her and said, worked out fine. Thanks for everything you told me. Can you imagine going to your mother? Well, maybe you can, but my mother never gave me quite that talk. She used to say, read the backs of the bathroom walls and the restrooms. And you can find out pretty much anything you need to know. Any comments or questions so far on Winston? Quite a character, colorful, certainly outstanding in his own day. Certainly someone I would love to see us study more or have more of his speeches or have our students study. We do have two questions um, that were piped in. One of them was, what was the background for Nobel Prize in literature? The background with? For Nobel Prize in literature. Oh, <coughs> it was the book he wrote on Marlboro, the one that was 1 million words and took 10 years. He won the Nobel Prize in literature for that. And then, uh, that was in what, 1953, I think. So Jenny, Jenny got gangrene, fell and broke her leg. The leg was amputated, but uh, she died, his, his mother, in 1921. So I have a question. <clears throat> How how did he end how did he end up marrying an American? That seems kind of unusual for that time frame. I mean, there wasn't a lot of. Clemmy get... wasn't an American. His mother was American. Oh, his mother. Okay, so Jenny how... was American. So how and... did she end up coming into the picture? Jenny? No, the mother that was the American. Okay, that's Jenny. Okay. His wife was Clementine. Okay. But his mother was Jenny, and she was one of a wealthy family in either Connecticut or New York, one of the East Coast. And so Randolph, who was a drinker, Churchill's father, he was kind of a ne'er-do-well kind of guy. He just thought life was for fun and uh, he was losing all the money that belonged to the Churchill family. And so he was sent over to America to look for an heiress who he could marry, you know, court and marry and bring her back to England. And then her dowry, which at that time, they still had dowries for daughters. And fathers would put very high dowries on the daughters who wanted titles. So because he was Lord and she would become Lady Jenny Churchill, she wanted the title. I don't think it was ever really a love match between them. I think it was more... Uh, he needed the money and she wanted the title and to leave the United States and go live the titled life of an English countrywoman, seasons in London, the clothes, going to court, being presented. You know, you always wore the three feathers for the Prince of Wales and you were presented to the king and queen. She wanted that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of like Cora in Downton Abbey. If any of you have watched Downton Abbey, it gives you a really good overview of um, the rich American woman marrying. And I, I, I think there's a documentary on some of the, the richest American heiresses who married um, the Prince of Wales before he met before he met Wallace Warfield Simpson, he was dating a couple of very wealthy Americans. Wallace wasn't wealthy and she had been married and divorced twice. So she had two living husbands when the Prince of Wales was interested in her. And when he became king, he wanted to marry her. And of course the government, including Lord Beaverbrook and the press, all of the English newspapers, they silenced it as long as they could. So only the American papers were printing stories of Wallace and her, her prints and their pictures were in the newspaper. But in England, you couldn't see any of this because it was silenced. And the, 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 the palace had asked them to not tell. But when it finally came out, the English people said, no way, you're, you're not going to marry a twice divorced American woman who would become our queen 
when you be, he thought when he became king, he'd have enough clout to be able to marry her and nobody would really care. She didn't really want it. She wanted to be what was then called a morganatic queen, which was kind of behind the scenes. She wouldn't be referred to as queen or queen consort. She would be sort of a wife, but he would then rule in his own royal uh, king. What was he? King Edward VIII, when he abdicated the throne in favor of his stuttering brother, uh, Bertie, from the king's speech. People didn't like her at all. Uh, and so they were banished, essentially. The one thing that David wanted for her was the title HRH, Her Royal Highness. And that was never given to her by Queen Elizabeth um, II or her mother um, ever. And he came several times hat in hand begging for this title to be bestowed upon his wife. Somehow it emasculated him to think he couldn't get that for her. He loved her that much. And then there's the point of view that he really didn't want to be king. He wasn't cut out for it. He was the playboy prince. Uh, he really, and so marrying her was his out, was the way he was going to, to not have to rule and take on all that responsibility. And of course, uh, Queen Mary, Elizabeth II's mother, blamed him for her husband's early death after World War II, that he had pushed her husband into becoming king, and he just wasn't cut out. He'd never been trained to be king, but it, the stress of it killed him early. And that's when Elizabeth II, well, she was only like 26, 25 or 26, when she ascended the throne with Philip. And uh, they had hoped for a few more years you know, before her father passed away, before she would need to take over. What time is it? It's seven after 11. Okay. So discussion, questions? Just a comment. It's been reported that Jenny had a tattoo around her wrist. <laughs> of what, do you know? Of a snake. Of a snake. And, and what kind of- To cover it up with, with a bracelet. A gold bracelet. Yeah. Yes. It's very good for her. Yes. And what was the snake doing? It's it's a very old, um, even into Asian cultures, Chinese cultures and Japanese cultures, having that particular tattoo. And it's a snake eating its own tail, which is the infinity sign in many, in many cultures. And supposedly she got that. I, I don't, I don't think in pictures you can actually see it. When, I've been told that Winston also had had one also, but it's sort of, uh, you know, when the three went to Malta, uh, Churchill and, and Hitler, uh, and Stalin. Churchill and uh, Roosevelt and Stalin. Yeah, yeah, when they were, all three of them had. <laughs> all three of them got a tattoo? All of them had tattoos. Had tattoos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I, I was reading about that, that, that she covered it always with a gold bracelet, but I don't think it's ever actually been seen in a photograph. The story exists, but I don't know if it's ever been seen. I'm not a real tattoo fan, but all three of my grown children have, have tattoos. My daughter, before a Mother's Day about 10 years ago, called me and she said, I'm apologizing now because I got a tattoo and you're going to see it when I come over for Mother's Day. I said, never mind, I just won't comment. On, and I don't comment on any of them. But I, I go, you know, if you were such beautiful little babies, you know, I used to put bathe you and you'd smell so good after your baths. And now to visualize you covered in this denim blue ink, you know, is just sort of discouraging. So they all know. Granny doesn't really like tattoos, so my granddaughter just got one. She got a cross right here on her. So now my daughter's in law, her mother, and other two sisters are talking about doing that. And I said, "Do you want to?" No, I'm, I'm, I'm. In my opinion, tattoos on a woman my age are going to end up on my ankles. You know, <laughs> when I get in the nursing home, we're all going to just be sort of sagged down there. So all these you know, really artistic. I go, why don't you just do a picture and hang it on your wall? You know, but they, they don't see it that way. Not, not a tattoo. 
This was his son, Randolph, married twice to socialite Pamela Digby and produced a son, Winston, who became a member of parliament like his famous grandfather. And his second marriage was to June Osborne, a daughter, Arabella Churchill. And for the last 20 years of Randolph's life, he conducted an affair with Natalie Bevan. I don't know who Bobby Bevan is. I meant to look him up. So he died at his home, Stour House in Suffolk, aged 57, very young, buried with his parents. I wonder where the Frederick came from, Randolph Frederick Edward Spencer Churchill. His daughter, Sarah Churchill, is Baroness Audley. She married. She's the British actress and dancer that you can find a clip of her. She was 67. She was arrested for making a scene in the street on a number of occasions, spent a short spell of time in Holloway Prison. And she wrote about this in her 81 autobiography, Keep on Dancing. So that might be an interesting read if you're interested in the children of Winston. This was the little one that died, Marigold Francis. Again, if you watch Downton Abbey at all, the daughter Edith, who had the child out of wedlock, the little girl named her Marigold. <clears throat> um, she had supposedly recovered from an illness and then it turned into septicemia. <clears throat> Rose sent for Clementine, however, the illness turned fatal and Marigold was buried in the Kensal Green Cemetery three days later. And supposedly Churchill painted kind of the same pond on the Chartwell estate over and over because his memories of this little girl and the color of her hair uh, were in the, the shrubs that bloomed around this lake and supposedly he always tried to recapture her spirit by painting at, at Chartwell. Mary Soames uh, died at her home at the age of 91. So that was his other daughter, the three children, Randolph, Sarah, Marigold, and Mary. So none of them actually, that's his daughter, went with him to the Potsdam Conference, uh, ever really did anything at all approaching you know, the career that he had in politics or as a statesman. So this was at Sandhurst, uh, a boys' school in uniform. You know, children were sent away to school fairly young. By about second grade, they were sent to boarding schools. Which one is he? Uh, Winston is this one kind of, his head kind of, can you see my finger? No, he's the one on the left with his head kind of tilted away from the picture. Who's actually a nice looking young man. He's getting on board, leaving for America. The troops loved him, absolutely loved him with Field Marshal Montgomery. Look at the devastation in France. You were in Paris this summer and it, you can see parts of it still left where they haven't rebuilt, same in London. That's a pretty typical picture of him. The newspapers in Minneapolis and St. Paul reported that the antics of Vice President-elect Theodore Roosevelt on a big game hunting trip, scandal had rocked the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where a congressional investigating committee was trying to determine if hazing by upperclassmen had caused the death of two cadets. Cadet, De Cadet Douglas MacArthur, who had survived the hazing, steadfastly denied that it could have killed his classmates. A new baseball league, the American Association, was being formed in New York. 
On the international front, reports from England describe the progressively worsening condition of 81-year-old Queen Victoria, and this is the year she died, 1901, whose life was slowly slipping away. Locally, the political scene was abuzz with speculation about whom the state legislator would select to fill the vacant U.S. Senate seat. And there was still a dozen years away. Popular elections were still a dozen years away. In addition to the news of the day, the papers carried a singular column of advertisements for amusements. In this era before movies and major sporting events, twin cityans looking for a night out could spend the evening enjoying the performing arts, theater, operas, vaudeville, poetry readings, or lectures. On the lecture circuit, a young man from England was making his way across the United States and Canada, speaking in major cities on the subject of his country's recent military struggles in South Africa's Boer War. Just 26 years old and recently elected to Britain's House of Commons, the young man knew his subject well for he had been under fire in South Africa. Captured by the Boers, he had made a spectacular daring escape. In some cities, his lectures were met with indifference or hostility. But in Minneapolis and St. Paul, full houses greeted the rising star on the global political scene. And the young man's name was Winston Churchill. So that's kind of how he first came to the United States in 1901, the year he went in to become a member of parliament as a liberal before he flipped to the other in 1906. So kind of his, his introduction. Would anyone um, like to take a look at the war rooms if you do want to, or any of these? I'll give two to you and you could just pass them around if you would, thank you. If I move, I can't um, see the Zoom students. And then the 40 ways to look at Winston Churchill. I was going to um, go over some of the contemporaries. How many of these do you recognize? He knew Ethel Barrymore. Yeah, you know Ethel Barrymore. Uh, Bernard Baruch, Cecil Beaton or Cecil Beaton, Gertrude Bell. I think she was a writer. Irving Berlin, uh, Isaiah Berlin, Maria Callas. So he knew her. Uh, Coco Chanel. Coco Chanel and Charlie Chaplin, Prince Charles, of course, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, Noel Coward, Albert Einstein, yeah, Annie Oakley. Now, there's a city, Driftwood, and I think there was a TV show, Driftwood, that was about Buffalo Bill Cody and um, Annie Oakley. Was it Annie Oakley? Yeah, she she uh, died there. They had had been a prostitute there, and she wanted to be buried next to Buffalo Bill. They were she had quite the crush. He knew Noel Coward, Albert Einstein, Dwight Eisenhower, Margot Fontaine, the dancer, Greta Garbo, Billy Graham, uh, William William Randolph Hearst, big newspaper publisher, Hearst Castle. Anybody been to Hearst Castle? in yep. California. Um, Herbert been. Hoover, I'm sorry. I have been. You have been? Yes. I didn't get there when I lived in California. I would still like to go. Henry James, Helen Keller, Grace Kelly, Joseph Kennedy, the father of John, Robert, Bobby, and all the, all the girls. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, Lawrence of Arabia, Somerset Mom, the author, Richard Nixon, Lawrence Olivier, Sir Lawrence Olivier, Aristotle Onassis. I guess if you knew Maria Callas, he'd know Aristotle Onassis. George Patton, Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Theodore. Did you watch the Roosevelts? Ken Burns did a, a documentary on the Roosevelts, Theodore and uh, Eleanor and Franklin. Vita Sackville West, she was an author, a member of a high ranking English family, but she was one of the first most outspoken lesbian women of the time. 
So he knew he knew her. George Bernard Shaw, Stalin, Henry Stevenson, Mark Twain, and H.G. Wells, the historian. So he lived in a time of a lot of very creative, influential uh, people, politicians, and I think still may have, in my opinion, stood out more than any of them. Um, I have done, we, I have a lot more Churchill stuff because I did an OSHA class in California, OSHA lifelong Ollie class, and we could do more. I have a, a series on women's diaries of the westward movement, the women on the wagon train, what it was like traveling across uh, from usually what St. Louis or right there around Missouri, Illinois, and that very interesting. I have that one that I've done, done movies and music of World War II, including some propaganda cartoons of Goofy flying the airplane and shooting bullets and dropping leaflets and things like that. I have Lily Okalani, the last queen of Hawaii, and um, Catherine the Great. She's probably my favorite woman in history. I think she's just a hoot. She, uh, she certainly lived her own life after she got rid of her husband. We're not sure who actually killed him, but she had to get rid of Peter. He was, he was weird. So I have, an, I have a series of, of um, biography on her and then Victoria, her later years, which I mentioned to you earlier. So if you're interested in any of those, I don't know if they give you an evaluation or feedback or email to Sarah, um, let her know. And uh, there is an opportunity for everyone to, to write requests of things they would like to learn about. So. Oh, good. Okay. What did um, you say about the wagon train, the women on the wagon train? Okay. Yes, it's there. It's from, it's information I researched through diaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was some Ken Burns documentary on the wagon trains, but I was always very interested in the women because they had their families and they may give birth, uh, a child may die, and you've got to leave them right there on the trail, hopefully finding enough rocks to cover the grave that uh, an animal won't dig them up too quickly. Crossing the waters, can you imagine looking at some of the rivers out here in Texas, crossing, well, not the Pedernales now, you could step across it, it's so dry, <laughs> but trying to, to cross some of the rivers to get over to California or Oregon, the two different trails, the Indians. Yeah, you just don't know what you're going to. You find. don't know what you're going to find yeah. or food. What to They tried to take things like their dressers and the pianos and their lace curtains. They thought they were going to be able to be left behind or, or it'd be float away down a river mm -hmm. along with maybe their children or their husband or their flower, whatever they needed for that. I thought, I think it's fascinating that women did that? What kind of a woman would you have to be to do that? Could I have done that? My mother could have done it. My mother grew up on a farm in Illinois with seven brothers, and she went to a one-room schoolhouse on a pony. So I think she could have done it. I'm not sure I could could do quite. Sometimes they didn't have a choice. That's true. Well, didn't they though? I mean, the husbands would might want to go. You know, the go west young man that they were all talking about. I don't know. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have fun. Try, try to write. <laughs> that that wasn't something. Yeah, that wasn't something they did at that time. Yeah, it was something I guess you did because you wanted to own land. Pretty much, there wasn't. Although, how could there have not been land back in the eighteen forties? Missouri and Kentucky and Tennessee. There had to have been farmland. There was something better. Is that what it was? The, the something better? Be happy with what you got. <laughs> yeah, you'd think if you had a house in Illinois somewhere, you'd be you'd be okay. But they, who knows what drove them? Who yeah, knows the amount of land that they could get? Yeah, you know that they could hold yeah. there. Right. Um, it was. I guess it was enough to, to draw. Go west, go west. And whole families went. So whole yes. families wanted to stay together and, and do these big homesteads with with all their families close by. I guess it was that a little like very, very interesting. That one sounds good. Yeah, it's it, there's some interesting quotes and stories of some of the women. And then um, the 
the little girl that got taken by the Indians, grew up with the Indians, and they finally found her mm -hmm. and brought her back, and she couldn't stay. She wanted to go back to the Indians. She had married Quana Parker's wife. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating, too. And Texas Indian history is fascinating. Yeah. I'd like to do something on that. I also think it's interesting, the, um, the fools, you know how kings would have fools who would come and entertain them? I bet some of them are women, and I would like to go back and find out if any of those entertainers in the courts back then were women and, and try to, I don't know, do a story or put together. I like to do research. Um, I read I read a lot. Then I get boring and I read Agatha Christie's over and over because I can't remember who did it. <laughs> so <laughs> There's a whole Agatha Christie tour in England. You can go and just do that. They put together a whole tour for Agatha Christie fans. Any of you read Agatha Christie? or watch any of the Miss Marple series or Hercule Poirot on, on television. What else, what else do you read? What do you read? What do you like? What do I like? Mm -hmm. What do you I like? I read very much. You don't? Because? Too involved in too many things. Okay, so involved in social, volunteer, teaching, children? Yeah, I'm on the board of architects. And uh, I'm not an architect, public member. Um, I don't receive the and Okay. I'm involved in I'm on the board of directors of uh, a credit union. Oh my gosh. And I keep my license active as a CPA. So when I was study there, so if I read, they're quick reads. <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm bored with just two. I like history. So yeah. my husband's a big buff in history. Is he? Any particular era of history? Um, Is he World War II or earlier than that? Or the Tudors? Or? Uh, Indian. OK. Native American. Native American. OK. A lot of them around here. Yeah. He wanted to come to us today and didn't get to. We could do one on Native American Indian. That would be fun. Come around here. Do you re do you read anything in particular? Oh, yes, I do, and, and I like um, World War II um, historical novels and the history, mm -hmm. and I like legal um, uh, novels. Um, courtroom courtroom drama. Oh yes. Yeah. Courtroom. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Well, Marilyn, I think the Zoom people are about ready to sign out. So are there any other questions? Any other questions or Zoom? there was actually one yeah, also Churchill in stuff. Um someone said it's been a pleasure to come this morning. Question? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Someone had typed in a question. What was and I'm gonna butcher it, checkers, C H E Q U E R S. I heard that Checkers? Was a, maybe. I heard that's where was an estate where Churchill spent a lot of time during the war. That that was his English estate outside of London. They had Chartwell uh, as well as Blenheim, but Checkers was an estate closer to London where they lived part of the time during the war, or at least Clemmy did. But uh, he was spending a lot of his time in the war museum and uh, going back and forth to Parliament, and of course, traveling to the US to see Roosevelt. But uh, Checkers was, was another home that they had. Okay, that person I just realized who she typed in her question and she's already left the group, so. Okay, so, well, yeah, I guess we, we have it recorded. <laughs> All right. Thank well, you. Thank you, Zoom class. Any uh, other questions from the Zoom world? Again? Thank you for the presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I like the Bill O'Reilly killing series. Have you ever read any of them? I've read almost all. I'm, I'm rereading um, Killing City Bull right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I like Killing the Mob. My daughter's a huge collector. 